Welcome back to Rachel and Maddie's not meth-fueled adventures. I like that. But still adventures. Still adventures. Hello, adoring fans who have the pizzazz of Lady Gaga's Little Monsters and the devotion of Taylor Swifties. How are we doing? Oh, I mean, yeah, but, huh. That's the reaction I thought you'd have. Yeah. I'm not surprised at, at all. But how are we doing? We're, we're, I'm good. How are you? <laughs> I'm great. I'm happy to be here. I, I, As always. I would hope so. Uh, fair warning, everyone. Um, I've just been storming on and off, so yeah. I think you the mics may have just picked up some thunder. You might get some more. Just enjoy it. Enjoy the, the ambiance. It's, it's added white noise in the background. Yep. It's in addition a, to our white noise. Right. This episode will not <laughs> include meth benders or uh, prison experiments or dark empath theories. A little bit lighter hearted on then my end Then what today. will it include? women breaking grounds and being pioneers in male-dominated fields. Fine, 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 fine. I will allow that. Okay. Well, before we can go into that, I, she always likes to deny that this is happening, but we do have to do Mm -hmm. eight second apologies. I have things that are needed to apologize for. I can't imagine what. Well, I'll just tell you them. Fine. I cannot apologize enough for Rachel's just epically long episode endorsing drug benders no i'm also sincerely sorry for the endless tangents and apologies for the punchiness of both of us in both the episode and minisode wow so one of your apologies you're also apologizing apologizing for yourself i am perfectly comfortable with self self self-growth accepting my mistakes i don't need to grow i don't make mistakes (laughs) i've never made a mistake in my life Anywho, are you ready to hear what I have for you today? Of course I am. I'm always ready. All right. Have you ever heard of the Grand Canyon? No. (laughs) Well, let me tell you. You don't need to explain the Grand Canyon to me. Oh, it's a massive gap in the western U.S. that has been unquestionably named Grand that all other canyons must now be compared to. Okay. Right. Now, the Grand Canyon is one of the seven natural wonders of the world. Okay. Um, It's not known for anything man-made. Okay. Of course, because it's natural. But there are several master architects that were influential in kind of creating the Grand Canyon National Park as we know it today. Okay. So before I reveal our heroine of today's episode, just quick little back background heroine? information. Our, our heroine? <laughs> oh. You See, said drug, no, drug, said drug benders. Drug I'm going to prove you wrong. Rachel brings up drugs. Well, just because I want, want to prove your statement wrong, but go ahead. Of course. Now, okay, obviously the Grand Canyon has existed way before it's been a, a U.S. national park. That history for today's story is not really relevant. Okay. I thought you were going to say it doesn't matter. <laughs> no, it definitely <laughs> matters because it's, it's honestly so interesting, even just looking at geological and natural history at, like, the different layers, but... That's not where we're going for today's sake. Okay, where are we going? We're going with the early 1900s. Love it. So National Park is established in 1919. Prior to that, it was kind of a battleground among different builders and developers trying to create tourist lodges and like summer camps and kind of things like that. I mean, just fighting for dominance at the Grand Canyon. Mm -hmm. Um, one of the developers in the area was known as the Fred Harvey Company. And I'm going to explain them once we get into our heroine, but keep that name in mind. Say it again. You know Fred, how I am with, na- with names. Fred. Fred. Harvey. Harvey. Fr- say it with me. Fred, Fred Harvey. Vish. <laughs> we can only expect so much. Fred Haverford. Fred. Har- Har- <laughs> Tom Haverford. That's what I got out of this. Okay. So Tom Haverford. Harvey. We have Fred Harvey. Fred Harvey. Um, But in my mind, he does look like Tom Haverford now. So be it. Um, 
So also to keep in mind, early 20th century, everyone hates the cities because they're gross. And so you have this rebirth of naturalism and this cult of nature, as it was called. Everybody wants to go out west and see the wide open spaces. Why not? Um, because obviously no one else lives there and nobody else has that land, right? No, okay. no, of course so not. <laughs> I will go ahead and disclaimer. We're going to, that conversation can't be had in this episode either too deep, but they can't. all wanted, Oh, I thought that's where you were going with it. No, and no, I was no, like, no. I thought you were just going to like gloss over everything that happened. I was no. like, Maddie, <laughs> we can't, there's not enough time to go into Got the you. amount of crimes against humanity that okay. were committed against I, Native I American tribes. Now. So just bear with me there. So over 40 years from 1900 to 1939, the park went underwent a massive construction boom both before and after it became the national park. So this is where our girl, Mary Coulter, comes into the scene. No relation, <laughs> but yeah. Well, obviously, because Hannah Coulter is a fictional character, but we can there's, no, there's, no, there's no inspiration there. No. That we know of. That we know of. So Mary Coulter was a female architect in the early 1900s. Now, Good for her. Right. So obviously this is incredible because it's the early 1900s. Very few rights for women. When she starts her career, women couldn't vote in America. Right. So yeah. crazy. Um, and it's architecture, which is a um, male dominated, dominated field. field. It was very looked down upon. She was not considered ladylike for this profession. So Oh, I'm sure. She's a queen and I love her. So she was born April 4th, 1869 in Pittsburgh. She spent most of her life living in St. Paul, Minnesota, um, but she was actually exposed there to Native American culture and specifically like the Sioux Reservation and some of the Dakota people. Um, And this is how she developed like a fascination really with Mm. Native American culture. And that was kind of in her early years. And then in 1884, she moved to California where she started being exposed to Southwestern culture, like area, all of it. So she attended the California School of Design where she really developed her own style and aesthetic and visited a lot of um, different tribes and reservations in that region to understand what made those tribes and their culture and their architecture and art unique. There's a whole other series of events that aren't important for this story, but she goes ends up going back to St. Paul works as a teacher she's like all into the world's fairs that start happening Mm -hmm. in the 20th century like Chicago and St. Louis and all those things and she comes in contact with the Fred Harvey company okay so the Fred Harvey company is like the premier service industry of the day and they specialized in what were known as Harvey houses um which were just like restaurant hotels I mean like bed and breakfast style love it like they are the Hilton before the Hilton almost like where they had the restaurants and the entertainment and, um, they had Harvey girls, which were like their waitresses. I'm not like, (laughs) it's so, yeah. So old school Americana. Um, so she starts working for them as their like interior designer and architect. Mm -hmm. So the Fred Harvey company is actually one of the most important developers of the Southwestern U S and a lot of the national parks. So they would, they would uh, build railways and build their rail cars and go r- ride out west. And as Why they not? went, they would start establishing Harvey houses. Um, and and one of their regions was the Grand Canyon. Okay. So this is all, a lot of this development is happening pre-1919. Okay. Um, so she, like I said, becomes the one of the, pretty much the spoke what not spoke, what's the word I'm looking for? Like the chief architect for the Fred Harvey company. Um, and she begins her construction at the Grand Canyon in 1905. So she is often considered like the unspoken architect so, of the Grand Canyon. So what is she constructing? Is she working on Harvey houses at all? I'll or explain. Is, okay. So, so like I was saying, Grand Canyon, you don't think of it for like the man-made structures, right? Right. It's, right. it's nature. Um, but she kind of becomes the master behind everything that is man-made at the Grand Canyon, if that makes sense, and basically creates the park as it is today. Okay. So her first construction is in 1905. It's called the Hopi House, and it was a multi-story building designed to look like Hopi Pueblos, and the the Pueblos are Mm -hmm. multi-story buildings. That's their word for it. Mm -hmm. Um, So the Hopi tribe is one of many of the Native American tribes that live in that region. So you also have the Navajo and... I'm blanking on every other one that was in there because I have them written down somewhere else. But 
I think that there's at least like four or five, like okay. all right around the Grand yeah. Canyon and bordering it. So she had observed some of the Hopi Native Americans and decided that she wanted to create a building that would represent their culture since they're kind of true ancestors and true, you know, whatever, inhabitants, dwellers, yeah. inhabitants of the region. Right. So the Hopi House was originally commissioned as basically a, a shop. It was buy Native American goods here, buy jewelry, buy rugs, you know, all those mm-hmm. things that were being sold and commercialized. One article writes that... Um, Inspired by the natural beauty of the Grand Canyon, Mary wanted to design something that appeared native, natural, and timeless. And so if you make sure to check out the Instagram pages and the YouTube video and things like that, I'll, you can see pictures of the Hopi house because it's so cool. Um, it's multi-stories. It has multi-leveled roofs, which was kind of a staple of the Hopi Pueblos. And it had like a rectangle shape. It's built out of that reddish clay stone and kind of yep. molded I'm, together. Yeah, I'm picturing it. Um and the one difference that she made from a traditional Pueblo was she put doors like on the outside of the walls, like traditional, what we would think of traditional mm-hmm. houses. Um, traditionally for the Hopis, they'd be put on the roof. So that was one change she made because it was designed to be for tourists. Right, right. Um, so this is actually still standing today. You can go in. It's still used as a Native American goods shop. Nice. Um, so it's super cool. It's very unique. It's like a really fun structure to look at. Um, So then she kind of takes a break. She's chilling out. We hit 1914, and she creates two new structures. So her next structure at the canyon is known as Hermit's Rest, like like a hermit. Yes, I know what a hermit is. Thank you. Good. So it was was built as a rest stop for travelers hiking around and traveling. It was like, come get your whatever you need. So this is actually how she quotes the the design inspiration so she says it was designed to quote resemble a dwelling constructed by an untrained mountain man using natural timber and boulders of the area so it's like if you look at the pictures it does look a little like like makeshift house with like sticks and stuff like that um but it was really supposed to kind of engulf you in the atmosphere and in the setting of like you're in this rugged wilderness and this I mean I guess it's not really a wilderness a desert right, and right. a canyon and you're hiking and it's hot and you only have so much around you um and that's what she like modeled her pit stop after I want an untrained mountain man to build my to house build you yeah. a shelter right no a house a oh, whole house the full house so it's like you're always kind of just it's a it's a gamble. Is it going to collapse it gonna, today? It's humbling. It's really, hum- yeah, it's humbling. Exactly. It's probably also budget friendly. Yep. Yeah. It it's, reminds me a little bit of like I'm. I picture some of like a Disney park ride where they like build their rides to look like mm-hmm. they're in the movies they're yep. in. Like that's what it feels like she was going at or getting out there. Yeah. You know what it reminds me of? This is going to be embarrassing for me. What? <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever seen the video of um, I don't know, it's like Vanity Fair or something. Um, of the inside of Matthew Gray Goobler's house. Mm-mm. So he <laughs> he has this like this. Uh, I think it's a, yeah, it's his fireplace. Okay. And it's just like the stone on the fireplace is just like a mess. And yeah, that's kind he, of the vibe you're he getting said, here. Um, I wanted it. It was something along the lines of like I wanted it to look like a drunk gnome built it, and I'm the only one who's bad enough at masonry to make it look like that. So he did uh. it himself, and that's exactly what I. That's exactly that's what, what we're picture. going with here. It's exactly Instead what I picture. Instead of what it was, it what'd you say? Something gnome, a drunk gnome. It was something like that. Instead I of might, drunk I might gnome, right. we have untrained mountain. Yeah, man. yeah. So, so that is Hermit's Rest, also still standing. You can go see it if you're ever at the Grand Canyon. Yeah. Um, we then have Lookout Studio, um, as the name suggests. Is it a lookout? It's where you can look out. Is it also a gr- studio? I, no. I mean, I guess what what is what's the technical term of a studio? Like it's a, not a recording studio. Like a, well, like a single room. Kind yes. Of thing. Then yeah. yes. Okay. So like a studio apartment. I automatically thought podcast studio as you because should. that's where that's I am. Okay. So it it was a viewing of the southern rim of the canyon, which was that's the bulk of like the commercialized part of the okay. Grand Canyon, anyways. I wouldn't know. And it was next to the El Tovar Hotel, which is 
at its time was like the most luxurious hotel in the Western U S love it. Um, also still operates today, which is really cool. So it was standing right next next to this. And this was more, um, rustic and was, you know, still playing off of the native American cultural feel Mm -hmm. of the Southwestern, um, tribes. It had parapet roof lines, stone chimneys, concrete floors, and exposed wood and stone with like, a butt ton of viewing videos. Viewing windows, not videos. I was like, are they showing viewing videos of the Grand windows. Canyon when they can just put, like, no. a balcony? <laughs> no. Um, so, it was really cool. Just another, like, really cool, like, staple structure that of, like, where you can go look out and see and kind of be immersed into it a little yeah. bit. So, her final construction, or I guess it's one of her final. I don't know if it's the final final. Um, the last one she's really famous for right. is in 1932. So this is after it's a park. Um, she creates the Desert View Watchtower. Um, also, like the name suggests, it's a watchtower no where way. you can go out and watch. And the desert? See in the desert. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Where you can view the desert. No way. And watch from the tower. No way. Um, I never would have guessed it. This is perhaps her most famous. Okay. Um, you know, it's like a, it's a famous, it's more famous than the other ones mm-hmm. in terms of the Grand Canyon. Um, so this is on like the Eastern rim of the Canyon when you're driving North to go towards the Northern rim. I don't know. Whatever. You, I, I don't, don't need, ge- I don't need driving directions. I'm, I'm, I'm like <laughs> thinking ge- geography right now because that's just how this place works. Cause there's how else you describe it when you're in nature. I'm like, we go North. I don't know. Anyways, it, it also was made to resemble a Pueb, uh, Puebloan watchtower. So same idea here. We know what her inspiration is, which I think is just super cool. It was 70 feet tall with a 30 foot base. Um, it also had a concrete foundation, but it had steel framework hidden under the stones. So it was like a layer of support, you know, so you whatever, see it though. which is pretty unique for some of its time, but you exactly. So you can't see it. Um, the bottom floor was like an observation deck, um, similar to like the lookout studio and the upper part was no, was the um, Hopi room, where it was another kind of showcase, a place to showcase the art, mm-hmm. and a lot of times different cultural practices of mm-hmm. the Hopi tribe, which was really cool. So each these are her four these are her four babies. These are her four buildings. Um, on May twenty eighth, nineteen eighty seven, they were all commissioned as or designated as historic landmarks. Um, nice. And so Mary continued to work for Fred Harvey until she retired in 1948. So she was like 79 years old or something like that. Worked there for quite some time. Like she, that was her thing. And so that means she is like her and Fred Harvey hand in hand. Um, She died 10 years later in 1958. And, you know, just her legacy really became interior design, architecture, feminism, Mm -hmm. preservation, development, you know, Native American rights, like, I don't know, just things like that. Like, she really kind of captivated this cult of nature and this um, kind of pioneering, but in, like, a healthy way, right. which I think is why she's really cool. So so I have a couple questions. Let's do it. Hit me that I don't know if you know the answer to. So, okay. What were they? Okay. Was she, like, credited with all of these from when she made them? Yes. So... But it wasn't ladylike, so it wasn't like a big deal, if that makes sense. It was kind of like that we, we don't really actually want to talk about it that much because even though she did it, it wasn't ladylike. So it was just kind of like brushed under the rug, if it, that makes sense. No, I, like, it's not like the Fred Harvey company like took. No, yeah, there was it. no like, I, from what I researched, there's not a situation of, yeah, Fred Harvey taking credit. Like, they just kind of known. ignored it. Yeah. It was just kind of like, yeah, she's our architect, but like, so what? Hmm. Interesting. The other question I have is, what year did she start working for Fred Harvey? Well, her first building was in 1905. So I would say between 1900 and 1905, she started working for them. I don't have the exact date. Well, 1905 was the first building she built for them. For Well, for the, at the Grand Canyon. She's built other buildings all over the Southwest. Okay. Well, either way, whatever. So she started working for Fred Harvey sometime in the early 1900s. Mm. How did she, like, get that job? So while she went to one of the World's Fairs, I don't remember which one. Yeah. She, I guess, whatever. She 
met like a daughter, I believe, of someone who worked at the Fred Harvey company. And it was like this really loose, weird connection. And since she had a background in interior design and architecture from the California School of Design, um, she kind of had a little bit of cred. And then she started just kind of building a reputation for herself after they kind of took a chance. I'm still, I think I'm just still surprised that like they hired her yeah. Even if she had all the I credentials think, and everything. I think she started out as more just pure interior design. Which makes sense. And that is that is what I thought when you said interior design and architecture. I was like, yeah, of course. And they. most people, like a lot of, I think that was the other thing when, to your first question. She was kind of more just considered like interior designer mm-hmm. for a while. And sometimes like a lot of history did her dirty in terms of calling her an interior mm-hmm. designer because... She really was the one getting her hands dirty behind a lot of the architecture and building the buildings. Yeah. I mean, and, they were her and maybe designs. she really loved both, but right, like it's not to say she didn't enjoy interior design or wasn't good at it, but like that is probably what she was hired for, right? And then it and it developed and grew from there. I mean, and I want to I'm trying to yourself. Let me, so her, so like I said, there was really like these informal connections to Fred Harvey mm-hmm. Company. So she got the job as an interior designer for what was known as the Indian building adjacent to this hotel. It's called the new Alvarado hotel in Albuquerque. Okay. And that's where she started to gain her skills, gain her taste. And then Mm -hmm. they just kind of, she kept getting more jobs um, at different like hotels. And like I said, these Harvey houses, because that's his world is like restaurants and entertainment and food and travel and all those things. So it's like, as he grew, she went with him and their company right and developed and that style she's getting more exactly yeah. so it's just kind of like as she kept going she kept getting more cred and then the grand canyon is really where she kind of like it boomed if that makes mm-hmm. sense in terms of her cred um and like i said she's i mean because the fred and fred harvey company went all over that southwest region of the u.s and albuquerque i mean new mexico arizona nevada utah california a lot of the development was because of some of their houses, their rail lines, the Harvey girls, the Harvey houses, all those things. Um, and she was instrumental in that. So, you know, her four, she has more than those four buildings. Right, of course, yeah. Um, so, you know, she she really definitely made a name for herself at the Fred Harvey, which is why she kept her job for so long with them. She just kind of kept going. It was 1902 when she started as well. Yeah, I also I feel like, you know, if you find a good job, in a male-dominated field as a woman in the early 1900s where you're making progress and moving through the ranks, you're not going to want to leave that job and risk it somewhere else. Well, and in general, that time period, you weren't... Like, our generation, we we are changing jobs all the time. Yeah. In earlier generations, you didn't... I mean, you just... just, First off, there weren't as many kinds of jobs. I mean, we have podcasting as a job now. We can have our own podcast. Like, it was like... Banker, lawyer, farmer, politician. I mean, you the, the essentially big had to like work for someone else. Exactly, yeah. you had a job, and that was your job for life. Like it mm-hmm. really was a career in that sense. Um, so there, the whole concept of almost like reinventing yourself wasn't necessarily like a thing. Gosh, so I'm, traditional. I mean, so, traditionally, she's kind of following tradition in that sense of like she got her career and she kept with it. So glad that I am not alive in that generation. I don't for know so many reasons what I would have done with myself if. Okay, well, let's say that was the only thing that was different. I would still like, yeah, die at that in that yeah. environment. You know how I'm changing but that's jobs where, like that's every where six nurture months. would come into play. You yeah, might be I mean, nurtured yeah. from birth to be like well, a completely. It's also person. the ADHD. Well, that <laughs> that's such a weird thing to think about. People in past times that have had ADHD, but maybe didn't know it. A lot of them, yeah. There's actually there's there's like. ADHD and autism and things like that, like, there's some discussion about that. I mean, it, most that I have participated in or have seen has been, like, informal discussion. Yeah. But a lot of times it was, like, you know, someone with autism was just, you know, they're like, yeah, he's kind of weird, but he's a really good farmer. Like, he's really good with his mm. everyday tasks, like, that kind of stuff. And because, you know, that's what it was. It was, like, they're weird right. rather than right. their brain they developed didn't have a word. But, but there, were thing, the- there were still things that those people were very good at. It's just they were often viewed as being different or had something non-traditional. Yeah. Weird. Yeah. Weird tangent for you, but there you go. So that is Mary Elizabeth Jane Coulter.
Good for her. She kind of has all three generic first names of like white What people. is it? Mary Elizabeth, Elizabeth Jane. Jane. I was going to say Anne. Mary Elizabeth Jane. I don't know that many Janes, I guess, but they still just seem like... She just needs like an Anne in there. And Grace. Grace. Not harping on anyone who has Emily. these names. Just making a joke, I swear. And I'm my not, name's Maddie. I'm not going to okay? mention my own name. <laughs> my name's Maddie. Let's yeah. be for real. We don't need to say anything else Hence about this being that. white noise. As I mentioned in the beginning. Literal, yeah. Are you just getting the joke now? I am. <laughs> I thought you were saying making a joke about like white noise as in like they'll listen to us as they nope. like fall asleep. That's not the joke I was making, no. <laughs> I'm also blonde, so there we go. We yeah. are meeting yeah. stereotypes today. We and I'm are. proud of, proud we of are. us. We are. We are. Um, but yeah, so check out, I mean, these I'll have pictures up of the buildings and Mary, um, on you know the social media so instagram and tiktok and we'll try to throw them up here on the youtube video um but she's just really cool she's i mean she's chill she wasn't flashy either which is part maybe why it was just kind of like why she did well in that time mary just made a tower <laughs> and now we're all like dude that's freaking what you, awesome what are you doing today mary <laughs> i'm gonna build a tower i'm gonna call it the watchtower too that's what i'm gonna call it you think she, you think she sounded like that no she's from minnesota yeah <laughs> Minnesota. Is that how you say it? Is that the accent? Don't ask me. I'm going to not offend anybody accents. else today with my accents. Yeah, but that's please. what I have for you, Rachel. So there's our Thank girl you. power. Little switch up from IMO, girl the power. meth addict. So I guess we should just tell the adoring little monster Swifties <laughs> where to find why does us. That sound, like, why does that sound patronizing? Maybe it's just because it say little. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. Something's creaking. What's creaking? Your chair was creaking well, right I, there because you were moving. Because I was moving, but I wasn't on whatever. Well, we've got creaky chairs. All right, go on. And that's the, I don't know. Here's where you can find us. Instagram. Hyperfocus pod. Twitter. Hyperfocus underscore pod. TikTok. Hyperfocus pod. YouTube and Facebook. Hyperfocus colon a podcast for chaotic minds. Make sure to join our page and our group on Facebook. And our Gmail. Hyperfocuscast at gmail.com. So that's hyperfocus C-A-S-T for all of the usual for love letters, hate mail if it meets the specifications that we laid out on the last episode topic ideas and um, don't forget that if you write a review of hyperfocus anytime in july take a picture of it take a screenshot of it send it to us on our email or on our like instagram dms something like that and send that along with your address and we will send you a little note and a hyperfocus sticker who doesn't love a good sticker i love a good sticker well i love a good sticker and I get here I am giving them away and, and yes, for free. Out of the kindness of your heart. Out of the kindness of my heart. She's a saint, really. Truly. 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 Mm-hmm. We've been new. Well, thanks for tuning in on another Monday morning for another great episode. Hopefully of this one actually comes out on Monday. Hopefully we don't have a repeat of last week's it disaster. Will. Have no fear. So we'll see you next week, guys. Stay chaotic, babes. <laughs>